Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload all things true crime, education and psychology related on this channel and if you don't already know, I do have a second channel where I upload regularly just fashion, lifestyle, beauty content, mostly like vlogs and hauls and things like that. So if you want to see some more sort of lifestyle content from me, then definitely check out over there because like I said, I do upload regularly on that channel too. So today I'm back with another case and this one is actually a Jane Doe case, but it's a solved one because I've had a lot of comments recently Recently saying that you'd like to see more solved ones especially since I think everyone can agree that the solved ones do bring a sense of peace knowing that their cases have been solved especially in the cases of Jane and John Doe's where it's just awful to think that someone could go unidentified for however knows long so yeah I'm bringing you a Jane Doe case that's solved. Before we get started with the case I just want to run through my usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos so just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel I'm simply relaying the information that I'm able to find my Myself through research of certain sources on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong, leave things out or mispronounce things and I apologise if I do any of those things. I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice, I am simply working with the information that I do have available to me. And with all that being said we're just going to get started discussing the case of the Dana Point Jane Doe. This Jane Doe case begins on the 18th of May in the year of 1987 in a place called Dana Point in California. In the early hours of the 18th of May that year, the remains of a woman were discovered at the bottom of the cliffs in Dana Point. It had seemed as though she'd fallen from the top of the tall cliff edge. At the time, the responding authorities had not been able to provide an identity for the unknown victim. All they could determine at the time was that she was a Caucasian female believed to be in her early 20s. She had had strawberry blonde coloured hair with a fair complexion and both of her ears were pierced. She'd been found wearing a tan coloured dress and what was believed to be her bag at the time had also been found at the top of the cliff. When authorities had searched through this bag that they believed to be hers, they'd found that it was completely empty. They'd also found that with the bag there had been a can of drink, so like a fizzy drink, that had been half finished, as well as a map of the Southern Californian area. These items alone, along with a pack of cigarettes, had been placed neatly next to the fence blocking off the edge of the cliff right at the top, meaning that in order for someone to have fallen off the edge they would have had to have climbed the fence. It had been believed initially that all of these items, since they had been neatly placed next to the cliff edge, they had all belonged to the unknown victim and that she'd removed them from her person before then climbing over the fence and jumping off the cliff edge. And since there had been nothing inside the bag or on the victim that could lead them to an identity of the victim, the only piece of information they had to go on had been what they'd found at the top of the cliff. Specifically, when they had inspected the map that they'd found, they'd spotted a phone number had been written on it and this had been the only potential lead they could have worked with. And as it would turn out, the phone number had actually been that of a local taxi company and when they had contacted them regarding this finding, they had informed investigators that they had in fact had a fare that required picking up at the nearby Hampton Inn Hotel at around 3 or 4 o'clock that morning. And this had led to the drop-off of an individual being completed by the driver in the area of the Dana Point Cliffs where the victim had been discovered. The driver had been questioned regarding the individual that he dropped off in the area of the cliffs and the description that he'd provided investigators with had matched that of the unidentified victim. According to the driver that had completed the trip, the woman had initially gotten into the taxi and asked to have been taken to Laguna Beach, which, as it would turn out, she didn't have enough money for the complete ride. The trip from her pickup point to Laguna Beach would have cost her around $20, but she only had around $18 on her person. And so, as a result, the driver had agreed that he would take her as far as he could for that fare, which ended up being around the area of the Dana Point Club. He stated that the woman in the back of his car said little else during the journey and they didn't really engage in much conversation, but he said nothing about her had struck him as unusual or concerning. Specifically, the driver had dropped her off at the corner of Scenic Drive and Cove Road in Dana Point and she thanked him for the lift and gotten out closed the door behind her and walked away. And little else came about from the initial search of the area, although when investigators had actually taken a closer look at the bag they'd found, they'd obviously initially assumed that it belonged to the victim, but when they took a closer look, there had actually been a woman's name. So the woman's name was Carol L. Pinkman, and this had been embossed onto the material in a gold font. So at this point, they decided to do a little bit of digging regarding this particular woman's name, potentially to see if this was the identity of the victim. So they searched through their databases and they'd actually found that 
the description of the bag had matched a report that had been filed in San Diego. So a woman by the same name that had been printed on the bag had actually filed a report in San Diego around 10 years before the discovery of the Dana Point Jane Doe. That she had had this bag of hers stolen by an unknown person and it hadn't been tracked down until that point. This seemed like at the time it may have been potentially an important link in relation to the Dana Point Jane Doe as there may have been some relation to why the bag had been found at the scene and relating to the identity of the victim. However, when this woman who'd been the owner of the bag and who'd filed this report in San Diego was questioned further, she had no recognition or knowledge of the woman known as the Dana Point Jane Doe. She had no clue who she was and she couldn't find any explanation for why her bag would have ended up on the cliff edge in Dana Point, aside from the fact that it may have been potentially related to the robbery of her bag that had happened around 10 years prior. It was later discovered that a potential sighting of the unknown victim had actually been reported and this sighting suggested that the woman had been spotted at the Unicol, I apologise if I mispronounced that, but the Unicol station in Mission Viejo in southern Orange County earlier on in the day heading in the direction of the bathrooms inside the building. But aside from all of these factors, as with many Jane and John Doe cases, there was very little else that could help investigators determine what could have happened and who they were. Her appearance didn't seem to match any current or recent missing persons reports and no one had recognised her or her appearance when it had been released publicly in order to appeal for any names. All in all, it seemed at the time that the likely scenario had been that the woman had voluntarily jumped to her death in an act of suicide based on the fact that there was this fence blocking off the cliff edge, preventing any accident, and it seemed as though if these items are found at the top of the cliff had been her belongings, she'd left them there neatly, they'd all been sort of stacked neatly by the fence. The potential scenario is her having fallen as a result of foul play, i.e. someone else being present and pushing her towards the edge, had been assessed and they'd sort of been suggested as a potential scenario is worth considering, especially once it was determined that she hadn't initially died on impact. So the victim had in fact initially survived the fall. As reports suggest that she'd moved slightly from the point of impact, there were marks on the ground suggesting that she had survived. And similarly to this, it was also considered that she might have fallen as an accident, but Ultimately, her death was ruled a suicide as it seemed to investigating authorities that was little else pointing in any other direction and this was the likeliest scenario. And years passed before anything else came about in the case and every time I research these Jane and John Doe cases, it honestly never gets easier hearing about all of these people who could remain unidentified for so long. And this is exactly what happened to this victim. For years, she was referred to as the Dana Point Jane Doe, that is, until the year of 2015. In 2015, more than 30 years after she was discovered, the Dana Point Jane Doe was formally identified as being 21-year-old Holly Jo Glynn. Holly Jo Glynn was born on September the 11th in 1966 in California. Close friends of Holly's had actually attempted to track down their long-lost friend in 2015 when they'd heard no sign of her after graduating high school together. And this had been some years prior to the discovery of the Dana Point Jane Doe. And in the later years, like I said, they'd attempted to reach out to this long-lost friend of theirs through social media but they found that she had no social media presence whatsoever and so in an attempt to track her down they decided to ring up her family to see if they could get into contact with her. However this obviously wasn't what they encountered. Instead they discovered that none of her close friends or family had heard from or seen Holly since September of 1987 and very quickly in their search they stumbled across the case of the Dana Point Jane Doe which sadly the news of this case had not reached Holly's friends or family and they all agreed that the description and the reconstructed image of this Jane Doe was uncannily similar to that of Holly and they very quickly realised that they may have stumbled across an answer to their daughter's disappearance all those years later. Holly's family had contacted the local authorities working on the Dana Point Jane Doe case and sent off a sample of Holly's DNA in order for it to be compared with that of the Jane Doe just in order to confirm whether or not their suspicions were correct. And then in May of 2015 it was formally announced that Holly Joe Glynn was the official identity of the Dana Point Jane Doe and the official listed cause of death had been a suicide. I honestly find researching all of my cases very difficult for one reason or another but like I said in the cases of Jane and John Doe's it really 
I think they affect everyone in the sense that it's so heartbreaking to consider that these people who have lived lives and they've got people in their lives that are close to them don't know what's happened or they couldn't be buried under their own names. It's just and their loved ones may not have ever received answers for what had happened to them. So in this case, I'm very, very thankful for Holly's family's sake that she could be identified even if it was all of those years later. Even though I can only imagine how heartbreaking it must have been for them to hear the news of their daughter's passing, I imagine not having any answers is possibly worse. So yeah, that was something a little bit different today. Um, a solved case, like I said, I don't do these often, but I hope you guys still found this interesting. Let me know if you do have any case suggestions down below. Um, always, always looking for case suggestions, preferably ones that are sort of not recent. I always like to do cases that are sort of slightly a bit older so that I'm not interfering with any ongoing investigations, but let me know if you do have any cases that you found interesting and I'll definitely look into them. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting and I'll see you guys very soon for another video. Thanks for watching.